it's good to have Brother and Mrs. Heminger back and their son. My, they just got back off vacation, and so we have still have many people traveling about and trying to get the vacation times in, and, but it's always good to have them back in town. Take your Bible, please, and go back to that scripture we viewed just a moment ago. Well, the Bible says in chapter 33, verse 12 of Psalms, the Bible says, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, and the people whom he have chosen for his own inheritance. You know, I, I believe with all my heart, and I travel extensively uh, and have for many, many years uh, overseas and preach in different countries, and uh, I, there is no place, I tell you, there is no place like America. Uh, with all of our faults, with all of our shortcomings, with all of our struggles, I believe we're still the greatest nation on the face of the earth, and God has blessed us. I want to give you a little bit of history and, uh, and uh, help us to kind of understand what God has done. Uh, let's consider the greatness of, a, of America. I'm talking about her greatness this morning. By the way, only God can make a nation great. Only God can make a nation great. Uh, Genesis chapter 12, it talks about the nation of Israel. But listen to what it says in verse 2. The Bible says, and I will make thee a great nation. Now, God said that. God said that. God said, I will make thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and I will make thy name great, for thou art, listen to it now, thou shalt be a blessing. Now, he's talking about the nation of Israel. But here, here's what we learn out of that verse. God is the one that blesses a nation. Uh, God is the one that decides, okay, I will bless a nation or I will have to correct a nation. Genesis chapter 12 and verse 3, talking about Israel. The Bible says, and I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curseth thee. The Bible says, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Now, as God is drawing attention to the nation of Israel, I can't help but think about our nation. Because you see, God has certainly blessed America. Uh, God has given us liberty, and God has given us freedom, and God has given us direction, and God has given us, if you would please, a purpose and a drive to be able, for the most part, yes, I said for the most part, I believe still in our country, to be able to have the saying, one nation under God. So how did all this come to be? We have a beautiful nation, but that's not why God blessed us. Uh, we have a nation of freedoms. But it's not because of man's elect that we have this nation of freedom. You know, today we have a lot of anti-Americanism that's going on, a lot of anti, uh, if you would please, patriotism that's going on. Uh, people are trying to revise history, and uh, they take away the character and the integrity of our forefathers as they try to diminish our history in the eyes of our young people. But may I remind you, please, on that sacred day where the Declaration of Independence was signed, uh, that these were mostly wealthy men that signed that document. Twenty-four of them were lawyers. Nine of them were landowners or rich farmers. Eleven of them were merchants. Others were physicians and uh, preachers and politicians. Uh, of all of, the fam all of the men that signed, only two of them did not have families. Everybody else had families. These were well-educated men. These were men that uh, had high standing in community. Uh, these were men of security. These were men of prosperity. These were men that knew that freedom was something to fight for, freedom was something to live for, and freedom is something to die for when necessary. John Hancock uh, said this when signing the Declaration of Independence. He said this. He said, I'm signing it as large as I can, and here's what he said, so uh, that the majesty can read it without using his spectacles. He wanted to make sure that it could be read. And he was a proud signer of the Declaration of Independence. Uh, Stephen Hopkins was probably the oldest one that signed. Uh, he had a shaky hand. He said this as signing the Declaration of Independence. He said, gentlemen, my hand trembles, but my heart does not. Now, these were men that took a stand. Uh, four of them uh, were delegates from New York and uh, very wealthy men. But as they were signing the Declaration of Independence, the British ships was coming into the New York 
harbor there. New York had already been evacuated. They knew that their lands were going to be uh, taken. They knew the sacrifice was going to be made, but yet they still went ahead and they signed. Now, because of that, because they wanted religious freedom, I said religious freedom, because they wanted religious freedom, there was a time when men came together and they sacrificed with their lives. They sacrificed by giving their very best so that you and I could have the country as we know the home of the brave and the home of the free. Now, can I tell you, it ought always to be that way. So I want you to see her greatness. I want you to see her God this morning, her God this morning. You know, America has good roots. We have good roots. Matter of fact, uh, the president of South America said this. He said, people would come to my continent looking for gold, but people that would go to America went looking for God. We have good roots. Uh, in 1620, the first uh, pilgrims arrived, and it was a band of people that crossed the Atlantic in a sailboat, if you will, uh, 26 by 113 uh, feet. And as they crossed the Atlantic through the bitter cold in the winter months on that uh, uh, compact uh, Mayflower, the second paragraph, as they arrive on the sea uh, shore line, says this. It says, for the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith. They came to establish a nation of religious freedom. That first winter was rough. Uh, five times a day were they only allowed to eat. But five times a day, you say, oh, that's a lot. Oh, yeah. But each of those five times a day that they ate, let me tell you what they ate, they only had five kernels of corn. That was it. Oh, you say, but yeah, five, 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 and five. Oh, no, no, it gets worse than that. They were only allowed to eat one kernel, Five times a day, one kernel, a total of five kernels a day. It was during those wintry months, 44 people died in the first five months. That only left 58 that survived. Uh, out of the 58 that survived uh, in uh, December uh, uh, the 13th, uh, when a massive uh, death toll was taken, you'll see that out of those 58 that survived, it came time to be able to invite some friends in. They found 80 Indians that was there. They celebrated for three days. It's recorded in the encyclopedia that during those three days, there was preaching, there was praying, there was singing, and there was eating. Now, by the way, you don't find that in the textbooks today. You find nothing in the textbooks today, especially in their public school system, where you find that they were eating and uh, they were praying and they were uh, preaching and they were singing. Oh, now you might find that they came together for eating, but you don't find the other. In 1863, Abraham Lincoln uh, proclaimed to our nation that there needed to be a day of thanksgiving. Uh, that was not a, a theological point. That was a practical point because of the fact that he wanted a nation that understood they need to be thankful to God. Amen. Today, as we look at July the 4th, uh, let's remember some of the people that had a part. Benjamin Franklin uh, prayed uh, before opening up a session, and he uh, was rebuked by one of his uh, cohorts, and he said this. He said, I've lived a long time, sir, and the longer I have lived, uh, the more convincing are the proofs that the Bible is true and that God governs the affairs of men. And if a sparrow uh, cannot fall to the ground without his notice, it is probable that an empire cannot rise uh, without his aid. Amen. You know, he understood that, that, now, we're not talking about uh, uh, a nation that just appeared. We're talking about a nation that God brought to birth. We're talking about a nation that God was in the very elements of its foundation. Uh, there was a, a letter, and I kind of wish it wasn't written, but it was written to the Dansbury Baptist Association. Uh, there was a farmer that was very concerned. Uh, so he wrote the third president of the United States, Thomas Jefferson, and uh, he was very concerned. And I, I wish that Thomas Jefferson perhaps would not have worded it the way that he worded it, but he worded it in the letter that there was going to be separation of church and state. Now, by the way, uh, in the letter, contextually, if you were to read that letter that Thomas Jefferson, the third president of the United States, wrote to the Dan uh, Burry Association, you'll find out when he wrote it to this collect Baptist gathering, uh, in the letter, it's not talking about uh, that the church is not supposed to be a part of the government, but rather it's talking about the government is not supposed to be a part of the church. 
in the First Amendment, it says Congress shall make no law respecting uh, an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. So we understand that uh, these people it's going around shouting, separation of church and state, separation of church and state, separation of church and state. It's in the First Amendment. They've never read the First Amendment. Because if they would have already read the First Amendment, they would see that it's not a part of the First Amendment. That was just a, a private letter that was written to a concerned farmer because he was in an association and he did not want the government to come in. They've already had experience of that in England. They didn't want that to come here to America. And so what he was doing is he was simply saying, hey, would you please protect us? After all, you are the president. And so they were writing a letter to him to make sure that they would be protected and always have religious freedom and not go back through the problem that they had before facing it over in the England area. Matter of fact, the first president, George uh, Washington, uh, took an oath in the office by putting his hand on the Bible because he wanted to show the importance of the Bible in our reigning land. And by the way, every president that has ever done that ever since has put his hand on the Bible. Now, may I say this? Uh, the very first president, uh, George Washington, also, when he entered into Congress, he lifted up that same Bible and he kissed that Bible. And then for two hours, for two hours after that, I'm talking about the very first session of Congress. He takes that same Bible that he put his hand upon, that he took the oath of, and then he lifted up that Bible and he made a statement, this is where we stand. He brought the Bible down, he kissed the Bible, and then for two hours after that, they had preaching in Congress. You cannot tell me that we uh, do not have a nation that was not established on the Christian faith and the principles of the Word of God. No, that's the nation that we have. And you ought to be proud that you live in a nation that honors God. You ought to be proud that you live in a nation that uh, wants a people to be able to receive the gospel of Christ. You ought to be proud that you live in a nation where those that are trying very hard to make sure that you have Christian liberties and trying very hard to make Make sure that we're going the right direction. Uh, we're getting them back in the offices again, and they're taking control of some of the political rims again. You ought to thank God. Don't hang your head down and say, well, I just don't know. Woe is me. No. Uh, you ought to thank God that we have some people that's in a place that love God, that love the Bible, that's trying to get prayer back in. You ought to thank God that there's a movement right now in our country to put God first again and to keep him first. I'm saying this. You think about this. In 1776, 11 out of the 13 colonies uh, said this. In order to be able to, 11 out of the 13 colonies, 1776, they said in order to be able to run for any elected political office, the only eligibility that you have to have is you have to be Christian. That was the only eligibility that they were looking at. You say, why? Because as a man is, so will he influence. Amen. Don't tell me, well, you know, a preacher, it doesn't matter what a person religiously, religiously believes in order to elect him to office. Oh, yes, it does. Amen. Because whatever a man is, is going to come out. You have never met a man in your life that had an opinion that did not tell you. Never. You've never had one person. I'm, uh, you know, there's people, mm, there's going to be people that get out of the service this morning, and can I tell you, they're going to have an opinion about what I preached. They're going to get in the car, they're going to drive back to their place or go out to eat or something like that, and I am going to be the subject matter. Now, I know that. You say, does that bother you? Well, I'd rather you talk about preaching than something else. But here's what I understand. I understand that uh, 11 of those 13 colonies had that requirement. In 1777, listen to it now, 1777, 1777, I get too many sevens in there. Uh, the Continental Congress voted uh, $300,000 out to distribute Bibles to every person living in America. Hey. To the entire nation. 
Uh, oh, I guess maybe they weren't Christian. I guess that maybe, you know, uh, they wanted to, oh, no. By the way, if we get uh, the Bible back in the public school, they change it. Yep. Uh, why don't we understand that what you put in is going to come out? That's why we tell parents, oh, please get your young person back under preaching again. Amen. Get your young person back under Bible reading again. Yes. Why? Because what you put in is going to come out. Right. Don't you be fooled. Uh, you sink that uh, ungodly music in, you're going to get the fruit of that. You sink uh, some unpatriotic things in, you're going to get that out. Right. I'm saying that uh, we ought to decide that you and I still love America. And we still love the God of our country. Gettysburg Address. Gettysburg Address says this. It says, this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom. That's in the Gettysburg Address. 94% of the founding fathers uh, here in the U.S., their quotes contain partial uh, scriptures in their quotes. Uh, the state, think about this, the state constitutions of all 50 states mention God. The state constitutions of all 50 states mention God. The famous uh, Liberty Bell has a part of Leviticus chapter 25 and verse 10. Leviticus chapter 25 and verse 10 says this, proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. Amen. That's on the liberty bell. A uh, part of the scripture, uh, Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 34, is inscribed over L.A.'s city hall door. So if you go to L.A., you'll see these words that's inscribed over the door, Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 34. It says, righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Amen. God picked the right state to put that in. Amen. The image of Moses carrying the tablets of law faces the speaker of the house and the representatives. Check out our buildings. The entering uh, president still, as I said, uh, takes an oath by putting his hand on the Bible and he utters these four words, so help me God. The Supreme Court itself, uh, in the sessions, uh, they say this phrase before beginning their sessions, God save the United States this, uh, and this honorable court. See, God is all through our society. That's why you don't, you don't need to be somebody that, oh, I tell you what, I'm just this little humble Christian and I just don't think I can. Oh, what are you doing? You can be proud of who you are. You can thank God. Hey, shout it from the mountaintops. Get on the house roofs. Uh, don't be somebody that's ashamed of the way that God made you and the, well, the country that God uh, put you in. Don't be ashamed of that. We are a Christian nation. You think about this. You think about the uh, first vice president and the second president, John Adams. 1798, he said, our constitution is made only of, the, of, of, of and for moral and religious people. That's what he said. President Thomas Jefferson said in 1781, he says, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just, that his justice cannot sleep forever. Our sixth president, John Quincy Adams, said this, no book in the world deserves to be uh, more unceasingly studied and so profoundly meditated upon than the Bible. Amen. Christian writings are all through President Abraham Lincoln's writings, 16th President of the United States. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt, America's 26th country, wrote this. He says, in their actual world, the churchless community is a community of men that have abandoned and have scoffed at those things which are religiously needed. It is the community that is like that that will rapidly have a downfall. 1917. Woodrow Wilson, the 28th president uh, and governor of New Jersey said this. He said, America is born a Christian nation. 
America was born emphatically to be a nation that uh, devotes itself to the elements of righteousness that is derived from the revelations of the Holy Scriptures, 1911. Calvin Coolidge, we called him Cool Cal because he was always quiet. 30th president of the United States said that the, they were intended upon the establishment of Christian commonwealth in accord with the principle of self-government. They were an inspired body of men that has been sent from God to the nation to send the choice of that which is grain into the wilderness who at the fail of the hand of destiny would not be prolonged. It says, who no doubt has been guided by the divine providence of God in the founding of her country, 1923. Franklin Roosevelt prayed a prayer over the national radio. It was right up to D-Day. It was June 6, 1944, as the troops stormed the beaches of Normandy and France. He said, Almighty God, I said he prayed a prayer. Amen. He said, Almighty God, says with thy blessing, shall we prevail over this unholy force of our enemy. Help us to conquer the apostles of greed, uh, the racial uh, ignorant. Lead us to the saving of our country. Thy will be done, almighty God. Amen. I can go on. I can read you about uh, Harry uh, Truman, 33rd president, uh, not known to be a, a committed believer at all. Misunderstood the Christian heritage and misunderstood most of the scripture most of the time. But he said this, if men and nation would live by the precepts of the ancient prophets and the teachings of the Sermon on the Mount, problems now would seem to be not difficult and soon disappear. And I'm talking about presidents that didn't have a good relationship with God. Uh, Gerald Ford, 38th president, uh, quoted this in 1955, taken from the speech of Dwight D. Uh, Eisenhower that was given on December the 5th of 1974. He said, without God, he says, uh, uh, there could be no America uh, form of government, nor uh, an American way of life. Do you understand that these men called out God's name over and over? Uh, President Ronald Reagan said this. He says, if we ever forget that we are one nation under God, we will be one nation gone under. Uh, George W. Bush, uh, he said this. He said, uh, uh, when asked his philosophy about the greatest influence he's ever had in his life, he said, I can answer it simply and shortly, Christ, because he changed my heart. And he was a drunkard. You see, uh, and then you hear our present president, uh, uh, one nation under God, make uh, God known again, over and over and over again. And I could give you uh, a 10 and 20 and 30 and 40 and 50 and no doubt even close to 100 or more quotes that he has given. I'm saying this. I'm saying that we have a nation that looks at her God. This is not a nation that you can look at and say, well, uh, you know, it, it was a Christian nation. I beg a difference. I live here. And other Christians live here. And I dare say there's more of us than not of us. And can I say that our nation is a nation where we ought to look at her greatness. We ought to look at her God. Then let me say this, and I'm done. We ought to look at her guilt. You know, uh, our nation has changed over the years. Now, that's not saying God cannot bring revival. Now, I preached in a meeting not too long ago. Older, stately gentleman came up to me. He was refined in his dress. He was a preacher. I mean, he had the uh, cufflinks on, and his uh, uh, shirt was neatly pressed, and uh, he had the little uh, pocket uh, handkerchief. And, uh, boy, he walked up to me very stately. I just got done preaching. I made a statement that God could send revival to America, and he walked up to me, and he rebuked me. And he said, I want you to know you're off. He said, God cannot send revival to America. America is finished. And I said, sir, I respect you for your age. I respect you for your position. But you're absolutely 100% wrong and in the dark. Amen. And if I were you, I would not preach that from a pulpit. 
You say, why? Because God is able. You didn't hear what I said, dear friend. I said, God is able. Don't you tell me that you've got somebody in your house that cannot go through personal revival. Don't you tell me that you've got a marriage that is uh, gone for good and has no hope at all and cannot go through a personal revival as a married couple. Don't tell me that. Don't tell me that you've got a wayward son that, or a wayward daughter that's uh, not close to God and, uh, and, and has no desire to be close. Don't you tell, don't you, don't you close the door on them. Amen. Don't you put them out in the cold and never let them back in again. No, I'm saying this. I'm saying, yes, we've got guilt. Uh, there's more abortions uh, than any other nation under heaven, and it's wrong. We've got drugs that's running the sea, streets. We've got marijuana that's been approved. And uh, we've got so many uh, homosexuality now. No, uh, sodomy has never been accepted by God and will never be accepted by God. But can I tell you, we've got a nation that is going down the tubes, but we've got a God this morning that can bring revival. We've got a God this morning that can wake up America again. And we need a, a group of people that just decide you're not going to throw in the towel. You're not going to quit. Listen, can I tell you, we do have a God that's a righteous judge. You read that in the book of Judges, but may I make it very clear to you. God is more about forgiving and restoring than he is judging. Now, I think some preachers need to look at the Bible again. But he wants to restore. He wants people to get right. Look, don't get mad at us when we try and help the fallen. Don't get mad at us when we try to help the backslider. Don't get mad. Don't. You say, well, we shouldn't because they're contaminated. Yeah, if you touch them, they will be. But we're not trying to do that. We're trying to help. We're trying to counsel. We're trying to love. The Bible still says in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, and verse 14, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, plural, the Bible says, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. You know, God is still about forgiveness. I'm going to give you five quick statements and my time is gone. Five quick statements. Don't worry about looking at your clock. We always dismiss right every Sunday on time. But uh, five simple statements. Statement number one, what can we do? Now, we're, we're in a painful guilt type of society. What do we do? Statement number one. We ought to participate praying for our government. Amen. Don't just criticize them, pray for them. Amen. I think the reason that our present president got elected is because of prayer. Amen. Now, I'm saying this, pray for the government. Christians need to come together and pray. Can I tell you, uh, in the Bible, when Romans chapter 13 was written, if you'll study your Bible, you'll find out that that's when the Roman Empire wanted nothing to do with God. There was great charges that was written against the Apostle Paul, and that's when Paul instructed us as Christians to pray for the government. So what do you do when hard times do come? You pray. You pray. By the way, what do you do if somebody mistreats you? What do you do if you feel like you've been cheated? What do you do if you feel like you've been shortchanged? What do you do if you feel like uh, you have gone down deep and come up shallow? What do you do? Pray. Sometimes I think we look at prayer and we say, well, I tell you what, the only thing I can... What do you mean the only thing? That ought to be the first thing. We, we kind of look at that, well, I guess I need to pray. Well, why not do it first? Why not let God break the chains of bondage? Why not let God move in? See, we treat God like God is not real. But my dear, beloved friend, God is real. You can shake the horns of the altar. You can get a hold of the throne of God. And you, you say, but I've got a, a mom and a dad that's not right with God. Let me ask you, really, how much do you care? Have you prayed for them? You come to my office and you say, please pray that uh, my husband will straighten up. I'm going to turn that cow on you. I'm going to let you milk it a while. And I'm going to ask you a question. How much you prayed for him? People come to my office and pray for my brother, pray for my sister. Mm, that's great. Get the preacher to pray. I'm all for it. Man, I'm all for it. 
go, go get some of the deacons and say, pray, pray, pray. I'm all for it. Pay them if you want to. I don't care. But can I tell you? <laughs> yeah, deacon says, I'll take it, I'll take it. <laughs> but can I tell you, it's those that's on the inside rum of that thing that should be praying. You ought to be the one that's most concerned. I tell the story, and, and Gary O'Neill's a pastor today, fine, outstanding pastor today. And I tell the story. But uh, every Friday, every Friday, I had a burden for mom and daddy to get saved. Oh, I wanted mom and daddy not to burn in hell. I wanted them to be saved. And by the way, you don't get saved by being good. You don't get saved by being baptized. You don't get saved by going to church. You don't get saved by keeping one of the seven sacraments or two of the Ten Commandments. You get saved through Jesus Christ, receiving him as Savior and him alone. Oh, I wanted mom and daddy saved so bad. I was in Bible college, Bible school, and I asked uh, Brother Appleby. He was the dean of men at that time. I think you met him, didn't you? Yeah, uh, he was the dean of men at that time, and he, he'll never forget. I asked him over and over again, finally said yes. We had a weight room. It was on the third or fourth floor. I can't remember which. And uh, we had a weight room where you go and work out, you know. But it always closed down at 10 o'clock. Well, I had my own business. I had a window washing business, had guys that were working for me, and I was always busy. But on Fridays, I'd always take off a little bit early, and it would be a day where I would just do my catch-up stuff that I need to do. And so every Friday night at 10 o'clock, that weight room, the fellows would clear out. They'd have to. And uh, they'd go about, I guess, getting ready for bed or studying or whatever they need to do to prepare for Saturday, Sunday. I don't know. But I asked Brother Appleby. I said, can I go up there when these fellows clear out of there? Can I go up there every Friday night? Every Friday night. I'd, I'll rent it if I need to. I'll give you money for it if I need to. But could I go up there every Friday night and just make it a prayer closet? Because uh, I can lock the door. Nobody can disturb me. And can I go in there and just make it a prayer closet and just pray? He said, what's so urgent? I said, I'll tell you what's so urgent. My daddy and my mama is going to die and burn in hell. They need to be saved. That's what's so urgent. I don't want them to burn. That's what's so urgent. And uh, he said, oh. And he said, okay. And uh, he said, you can do it. So he gave me a key, and I went up there. I didn't know that somebody else had a key. I, I didn't know that he'd go in and clean it afterwards. I didn't know that. But uh, long about 10.30 or so, 11 o'clock or so, and I'd pray from uh, 10 to 12 uh, on Fridays. And, uh, but, uh, but long about, uh, oh, 10.30 or so, 11 o'clock or so, that door squeaked open. You knew somebody had a key. And there's no door that squeaks like that. And so uh, all of a sudden, a person walked in, and, uh, and I was over there. I was crying. I mean, I was praying, I was begging God to save mama and begging God to save daddy and my brothers. And, and man, I was praying earnestly. And, uh, and a couple of times this person just walked in, they left. I guess they felt like they shouldn't disturb. But oh, about three or four times later, he came in and he came over beside me, Brother Denton, and he put his hand on top of my shoulder. He didn't know my mom and daddy from Adam and Eve. He didn't know them. And he put his hand on my shoulder and he knelt down beside me. And he started to pray. I was weeping. I was crying. I went and mom and daddy saved. And, but he put his hand on my shoulder, and he started to weep, and he started to cry. And did you know every Friday night, he never did say anything to me. Never did. Never did. But about 10, 30, 11 o'clock-ish or so, that, that door would squeak open. You know, it'd squeak open. He would come in. He would walk over. He kneeled down beside me. He put his hand on my shoulder. He'd pray with me for about 30 minutes. I went by for about a month and a half. I still didn't know who the guy was. And uh, he come over, because I, 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 I was still so burdened, you know. And, but he'd come over and put his hand on me, and he'd pray. And he'd get up and leave. And about, about a month and a half or so, I noticed this. I noticed that when he came over and started praying with me, Brother Barker, he started crying too. Now, he didn't know my mama. He didn't know my daddy. But you see, something was catching. He's picking up my burden. Something was catching. I, by the way, later on, he became best man in my wedding. I found out who he was, by the way. <laughs> but I wish churches would get back to putting away the religious facade. Right, right. I wish we'd get back to old-timey religion. Right. I wish we'd get back to where, put your facade down. Right. Uh, come to church and just be wide open for the Holy Spirit to work in your life. 
and put away all these things and, and, and get rid of all these things out of your life and just let God, I said, let God be real with you. You understand this. Statement number one, I said so you pray for the government. Pray for the government. Uh, the Bible says over in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 1, he says, I exhort you therefore, it says, first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions. It says, and the giving of thanks be made for, uh, for all men. It says, for kings, for all that are in authority, that you may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. So we're supposed to pray. Why do you pray for the king? Well, the Bible says in Proverbs that the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord and he turneth it whithersoever he wisteth. Yeah. So why do we pray? Because God can change a person's heart. Here's what we do. Praise the government. Don't be a police or a, nowadays they use the word cop a lot, but don't be a police or a cop basher. Don't do that. Instead of bashing them, buy them a coffee. Buy them a soda. Uh, uh, help them. Encourage them. You say, well, they're not always right. Yeah, and you are. They're more right than the burglars. They're more right than the criminals. Teach your children to honor them. Teach your children that these are the heroes of our day. Take your children up so that they're not afraid of policemen and say, hey, look, this man right here is a hero. Shake his hand. Let your child see you treat him to a meal. Pat him on the back and say, thank you so much. I'm saying this, praise the government. What do you do? Participate in government. Participate in government. Uh, uh, we've had the mayor here of Mesquite a couple of times, and he and I have become friends. And uh, he'll come to my office, and, and I'll go to his office. And every single time I've sat down with our mayor, my good friend, here's what he does. He always cries. He always cries. I'll say, how you doing? He'll begin to cry, and he'll say these words, God is good. He'll just cry. He's running again in 2019. I said, I'd like to get a guy like you back in office. Because I'd like to get somebody back in office that has a heart for God just like you. Now, he may not have everything right, but neither do we. But I'm saying that what do you do? Here's what you do. Uh, you, you, you praise them. You praise them. Uh, you know, you be that individual that uh, uh, pats them on the back and says, hey, I hope things are going well for you. You're doing a good job. Come on. Hey, now, now look, you know, come on. You, you, you can be somebody that loves other people if you want to. You can be a sourpuss if you want to. You, you know, come on. You sit there as I preach. And... <laughs> you look like you got a tummy ache. I'm saying this. I'm saying you pray for them. You praise them. Participate, as I said. Participate. Get involved. Get involved. You know, I'm involved with several government officials, and, and we talk, and just as casual friends, they'll say, what do you think about that? And I'll tell them, well, that's the dumbest idea I ever heard. Or I'll say, well, that's a pretty, that's a pretty bright idea. I think I'd go that way. If you got the influence, go that way. Go that way. You don't have to be afraid of politicians. You don't have to be afraid of those that's in government. You don't have to. They're not coming after you. They don't want you, but you can influence them. And I'm saying lastly, here's what you can do. Uh, you can also be one that uh, uh, persuades government. You say, preacher, what do you say? I'm, I'm not just saying, I'm not just saying being in their present and dropping a line or two, but you, you know, you can actually become friends with somebody that is in government, I'm, I'm including the police there. I'm including uh, those that's a part of Congress. I'm including, and, 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 and it wouldn't be bad for some of you to run for Congress one day. I heard preachers many years ago, they said, well, you ought to separate yourself from the government. No. You ought to get involved in it. You ought to become it. Somebody's got to fill that office. Why not somebody that's righteous? Why not somebody that's holy? Why not somebody that loves God? Come on. I'm saying this this morning. I'm saying we have a blessed nation. Now, we can work hard to keep it that way. I think it's going down the right track. I feel good about it. I think it's going down the right track. But you can do what you ought to do 
You, you know, you, if you wanted to, if you wanted to. Now, by the way, only do this if you've got good uh, intentions. But if you wanted to, you could spend time with anybody you wanted to in government. Because they're there to serve the people. Yeah. People say, well, uh, they say, preacher, man, you're an awful busy fella. But I'm never too busy for you. And I always make time for people. And you're going to find out that anybody has a servant's heart, they do the same thing. They always want to help people. Now, I'm saying there's a way. We have America. America, our blessed nation. Let's keep it that way. Let's make it better than it is today. Father, help us, I pray.